Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We are going to get started in a few minutes. We're just going to give um, your peers a chance to hop on. But in the meaning, in the meantime, um, please feel free to just drop a note in the chat sharing where you're joining us from tonight. Amazing. I see people coming from all over. It's yeah, moving fast. Wow. <laughs> just pouring in. <laughs> mm -hmm. It is so great to have you all here. I'm seeing some folks coming from Canada. I saw Toronto and Vancouver. I see Massachusetts, Ohio, Minnesota, Pennsylvania, Georgia, South Carolina, Hawaii, California, Nigeria. Nigeria. Wow. Amazing. Really all over. Mississippi. I saw somebody earlier say they're coming from home. They're calling in from home. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Me too. Although this is my studio, but it's home. <laughs> Well, somebody's happy about Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> As are we all. I love this energy, everybody. I see someone who has their hand raised. If you have a question, feel free to drop it in the Q&A box, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. Um, I see a few questions in here already. So first off, yes, this session is being recorded and that recording will be shared. Um, second of all, how long does this usually at last? Um, this will last for an hour. So I'm on the East Coast. We're starting in one minute at 7.30 and we will wrap up at 8.30. If you are on the West Coast, that means we're ending at 5.30. And last questions I'm seeing here, what do we need for this class? Um, nothing, but you are welcome to have some materials if you wanted to draw along. It's a good idea, but I'm not, I'm going to ask, I'm not going to ask you to draw. I'm going to ask for your opinion on some things, but. Someone asked, is our mic and camera on? No, your mic and camera is not on. Just ours are. My uh, Eliza's and mine's. Um, someone's asking, why is the music so loud and how do I make it quieter? We're not playing any music. Um, so that might be coming from another window on your screen. All right. Well, we are right at 7.30, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. So thank you all so much for joining us tonight. My name is Katie Bonner, and I am with the Alliance for Young Artists and Writers, the organization that pre presents the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards. I am joined today by the incredible Liza Donnelly, who will be leading tonight's session. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the workshop before I pass things off to Liza. So, you are all joining us tonight for our first ever Drawing and Cartooning Workshop Series. Thank you all so, so much for being here. We are thrilled to have you. This event is sponsored by the Herb Block Foundation and the Alliance for Young Artists and Writers, which again presents the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards. Um, if you are in going to be in seventh grade through 12th grade this fall, and if you are going to be 13 years of older by around December of this year, then you are eligible, and if you're located in the US and Canada, you're eligible to participate in the Scholastic Awards. 
Um, and any piece that you make from this workshop, to anything inspired by this workshop, you can enter in the Scholastic Awards and it may be eligible to win a scholarship of up to $1,000. Um, so very exciting opportunities to come from this, but regardless of whether or not you are eligible to join the Scholastic Awards, we are so thrilled that you are here and that you are creating with us this summer. So just a quick overview of the schedule. Today we are going to be focusing on an introduction to cartoon formats and techniques with Liza. Um, next week we return to, to cover illustration techniques with Peter Cooper. And the following week on August 16th, we are going to cover um, expressing your perspective in what you've been drawing with Lalo Alvarez. And then we invite you all back on September 16th whoop, um, for a revision session. So we invite you to bring your artwork with you to the Zoom meeting, and you will have the chance to share your artwork with each other and with a small group, uh, a small group of your peers and with um, one of our illustrious artists, whether it be Liza, Peter, Lalo, or another Art and Writing Awards juror who will provide constructive feedback on your piece. So we will email out the Zoom link to join the September 6th session after our series wraps up on August 16th. Um, but you can use the same link that you used to join tonight for the next two weeks. So don't lose track of the Zoom link that you use tonight. You can keep attending with that same link. And with that, I wanna cover a couple of logistics for the workshop. If you have any questions, you can drop them in the Q&A box. We will take some time to get to them at the end. While Liza is presenting, I'm gonna mute the chat unless she invites you to um, provide feedback in the chat. That way we don't get too distracted by what's going on in there. Although again, I love the energy that's coming through. Um, and you can turn on a live, you can turn on closed captioning if that would be helpful for you throughout this session by going to the bottom of your screen and clicking, you should see either two CCs there or click more and then you'll see the two CCs there. And last but not least, this is being recorded and we will share it with you later. And now with that, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce you to Liza Donnelly. Liza has been a juror with the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards, but she is also a renowned artist and writer with a storied career. Um, Liza has had children's books published with Scholastic Publishing. She is an award-winning cartoonist with the New Yorker Magazine where she has been drawing cartoons and writing about culture and politics for 40 years. She has contributed to CBS News, CNN, um, the New York Times, CNN Opinion Pages, the Washington Post. She has drawn political cartoons and done live drawing, special cultural, live drawing for special cultural and political events, including the Oscars. Um, and she is also an accomplished screenwriter working on her third feature and currently pitching a documentary. So Liza, we are so excited to have you. Thank you for joining us and take it away. Thank you, Katie. I'm so, so, I'm so excited to be here. Um, thank you for asking me to do this. And, and I, you know, I know Peter Cooper, He's, I, I want to sit on his class because he's amazing. And I've not met Lalo, but I know his work. He just won the Pulitzer Prize, I think, recently. So um, his his class is going to be um, really informative, I know. But um, anyway, I'm, um, I'm uh, tuning in from the uh, Hudson Valley of New York up, up above the city. And this is my studio. And you can see I've got lots of books from, I've been, you know, I've been alive a long time, so I collect books. <laughs> and um, and I'm going to show you an overview uh, today um, of the different kinds of cartoons that that are possible, that are that are available to you. If, you know, you're all aspiring artists, and maybe some of you know exactly where you want to go with your work, but maybe some of you aren't sure. So I'm going to give you a little smorgasbord of of what's out there, and some of some of those things I've tried, dabbled in um, to very varying degrees of success over the years, but. Um, I'll show you some of my work too. So um, I'm gonna show you a slideshow. Oh, first I wanna say um, a few things about myself, uh, personal, uh, outside of the bio. So I started drawing when I was about seven years old and drawing cartoons to make my mother smile. She gave me a book of cartoons by a man named James Thurber, who was a cartoonist in the thirties and forties um, before my time. <laughs> and I would trace his cartoons. And I also traced um, Peanuts, which I loved, Charlie Brown and Snoopy. Um, 
And then I developed my own style and it made my mother smile. And, and so I was hooked. And then I drew for my friends in, in school. And uh, I was always just working on my own drawing. And, and a lot of it was for myself too, because I was really, really shy. And I just wanted to be left alone, be by myself. And I bet some of you are like that too, because I think artists can often be that way, very you know, reserved or wanting to do their own thing with their own work. Um, and I and I was like that. So art helped me cope with my my uh, school years. And I drew through college. And then it wasn't until I got to New York. I got a job at a, at, at a, a museum in New York City. I'm from Washington D.C. And um, I kept drawing. And I started submitting to the New Yorker magazine. And I took classes at night um, and to to form my work. So I. Um, I got guidance, even though I had been draw drawing by, by myself or for myself for years, self-taught really, I did get some guidance from classes in, in, in professional schools. Um, and um, I learned early on, and all that time I, I submitted the New Yorker and I finally sold after a couple of years to the New Yorker magazine, which is huge for cartooning, but I was also doing illustration work. So I learned early on that you have to do a lot of different things to be a freelancer, which is what I am. You can't just rely on one, unless you become a really well-known syndicated comic strip artists or children's book author. We'll talk about that in a minute. But for me, it's always been a, a variety of things. And I actually love doing a variety of different kinds of art, all based on my style and what I what I've created when I was a kid, um, the kind of style that I have. Um, but uh, you learn to love to learn new ways of doing things. And I think that's the beauty of, of cartooning is you can use a lot of different forms. Um, so I'm going to just walk you through, I'm going to share the screen, um, the little PowerPoint I put together. Um, let's see, where is it? There it is. It's not on the right slide, so let's go up here. Okay. Can you see it? Katie, is it visible? Yes, looks great. Okay. Um, so, <clears throat> Comic strips. Now, I know you all know comic strips. Um, let me get my notes up here. I have some notes, what I want to say. Well, I don't want to forget something, so I, I take notes. Okay, so um, we all know comic strips, right? And I'm not going to show you anything you don't already know. Like, my favorite growing up was Peanuts. Um, and I don't know if you guys get the newspaper at your house, whether you see cart comic strips in the newspaper. Maybe you look at them online now, but there's so many different ways of doing comic strips. Um, this is just one example. And um, generally speaking, comic strips, as you guys know, probably has a cast of characters. You know, Lucy, Linus, Charlie Brown, Snoopy is just a tip of the iceberg of pe people that you see on a regular basis. Stories every week, every day, different stories about this cast of characters. Um, and you have to learn how to draw them the same way every, every day. Um, I have not done this. <laughs> I did try comic strip and I had a comic strip for a little, little while in a magazine called American Photographer and that was fun. But it was hard to be consistent and keep the same characters uh, every single time. So I have great respect for people like Charles Schultz. This is, um, um, oh, remind me the name of this. Gosh, it's not one that I used to watch or read. Calvin and Hobbes? Calvin and Hobbes, of course. Um, not one that I grew up on, but I know people love Calvin and Hobbes and, 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 it's, and it's, it's, it's animals, right? Um, and then Curtis is a, a well-known comic strip based on an African-American family and, and community. So there's a lot of different ways of, of doing this and you have to work with the syndicate to do these. You can do comic strips on your own um, and there are web comics, which I don't really know anything about, but there are comic strips online, which you guys probably already know about and you could tell me about, but, um, uh, and there, anything on the web tends to be easier to get published than working with a, you know, a huge syndicate, um, uh, that, that publishes the cartoons in the newspapers. And, um, that's how the cartoonist gets the money. So they have to and many of these people have assistants and people who draw for them. Charles Schultz did not. Then there's editorial cartoons, which both Peter Cooper and Lalo Alvarez are editorial cartoonists, and I am too, but they do it more often than I do. I do a lot of different things. I do single panel as well as, as editorial, but editorial are also known as political cartoons. 
And um, it's a field that's going through a lot of changes right now um, because newspapers are, are not surviving very well. There are not as many newspapers now as there were when I was young. They're, they're, they're dying out for a lot of different reasons we won't go into now. So it's harder for cartoonists to become editorial cartoons, cartoonists. The first one, one of the first ones I knew about was a man named Gary Trudeau. He's still, he's still working and he's publishing on, online mostly. And Doonesbury was a famous cartoon strip uh, in the 70s, started in the 1970s, and it was political. It was nobody had seen anything like it before. They didn't know whether to put it on the political page, the op-ed page, or on the comics page. Um, but it's he. It was very verbose, very wordy. Drawing is beautiful, but he did use a lot of words. Um, and then another kind of editorial editorial cartoon. This is one of Lalo's is using symbols. I use a lot of symbols using the um, Statue of Liberty. There's Kamala Harris and Joe Biden in two different symbols. So political cartoonists often use a lot of symbols. And they, I don't, I don't know if Lalo is with a particular paper, he'll, he'll tell you or whether he's syndicated because many of these political cartoonists are in syndicates, a different kind of syndicate than the ones that run them. Or maybe it's the same. I think it's maybe the same or there are specific syndicates for political cartoonists where the syndicate will accept your work if you're signed with the syndicate, and then they will they will offer it to newspapers, and newspapers can publish it uh, if if they want and give money to the syndicate. Then he pass, the syndicate passes on money to the to the cartoonist. So um, you're in a pool of other cartoonists to be selected um, each week or each day by newspapers or magazines. Um, Another, this is Lisa Benson, a cartoonist. I forget where she's based out of, I've not met her. Um, but again, there's a symbol. Russia is a bear, is a typical editorial cartoonist symbol. And it looks like Lisa works on, um, on the computer. And the Ukrainian flag is a symbol. So cartoonists, political cartoonists are really comfortable with symbols. Um, China, red, and the two uh, donkeys representing um, Democrats. <clears throat> um, this is Michael Deadder, and I just want to show you this because he's uh, he's using a, a caricature of Donald Trump, and a couple of years ago, during the during the uh, beginning of the coronavirus, and and Michael is a master of of caricature, and if you study his work, you'll see it's a lot of cross hatched lines. So he's a lot of detail. He once said to me on Twitter, I've not, I've not met him, but we've talked on Twitter. And he said, uh, he said, he said he was complimenting me on how minimal my drawing is. And if you, when you see my work, it's really minimal. I use very few lines sometimes. And he uses a million lines. So he was kind of jealous that I was only using a few lines to say what I wanted. Whereas his style uses a lot of lines and it does it really successfully. He now is one of the cartoonists at the Washington Post. He lives in Canada, but he's he's uh, the regular cartoonist at the Washington Post. So his style serves him well and it works well with what he wants to say and how he wants to say it. Um, the single panel is what I know best, single panel or sometimes, sometimes called gag cartooning um, are usually in magazines. Although sometimes you'll see a single panel cartoon in in uh, the newspaper, a single syndicated uh, comic panel. Um, this is James Thurber, the, the man I mentioned earlier. And the woman is speaking and she's saying, what have you done with Dr. Milmos? It's just totally silly that she's standing next to a hippopotamus and asking him about Dr. Milmos. But, and this was probably from the thirties. I don't remember the date on this particular cartoon, uh, but uh, it's always, it's pretty much always one panel with a, uh, a line of text underneath, which is somebody saying something in, in the cartoon. Uh, and uh, single panel cartoons started, they, they were around for years uh, before the New Yorker was founded, but the New Yorker really sort of, in 1925 when it was founded, it made gag, uh, I, don't, I don't like that word, single panel cartoons, um, it elevated the art form to, to really beautiful stuff. This is Charles Adams. I don't. You may have heard of his name before from the Adams Family TV show. It was on Broadway based on a series, a, a, a bunch of characters that he drew. And this is, his stuff was very sort of uh, macabre. And this is an example of something that Charles Adams would do. Using wash and pen and ink and gray, gray wash, probably uh, watercolor. 
This is Peter Steiner. Uh, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. <laughs> this was done early in the years of the internet. And um, this, is a, this is a really famous cartoon that was reprinted, reprinted many, many, many times. And Peter has worked for the New Yorker for 45 years, I think. And um, New Yorker is really one of the few places left that uses the single panel kind of cartoon. There are a few other places, but the New Yorker is the, the, the place you want to be really. Um, if you're doing this kind of cartoon. Roz Chast is another well-known New Yorker cartoonist and her stuff is a little off, a little, a little uh, off kilter, sort of a little, 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 little odd, a little weird sometimes. And she's, she has a huge following because people love her, her odd view of the world. And, and many times these, these single panel cartoons are not just a joke or a, a pun but they are a worldview. Like Roz has a very particular worldview. She's from New York, from Brooklyn. She's a bit neurotic. She's a very good friend of mine, so I can say that she would agree. Um, and her 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 cartoons are about her take on the world. And this is one that she did. It's called When Moms Dance, and the daughter is sitting there. Now she's used a sp speech balloon in the cartoon, which which is sometimes done. She's saying, "Stop! You're hurting me." So her mother's dancing, and, and it's really annoying the teenage girl. And this, Roz told me that this came from, from real life, that she did this and her daughter was astounded that she was actually dancing. So sometimes we take cartoon, we take ideas from real life. Cartoons, single panel cartoons often, actually a lot of comics are about, about life experience, stories that you experience in your own day-to-day -day life. This is by Michael Maslin. And I wanted to show this to you because for two reasons. Cartoons, you can make anything happen in cartoons, right? You can, this is a talking pie. I mean, why not? The pie is say, saying to the man, come on, you want a piece of me? So he's, he's ready for a fight with the man. Um, and this cartoon, the second thing I want to tell you was done by my husband, who is also a New Yorker cartoonist, Michael Maslin. Simple pen lines, he draws on typing paper. He uh, uses a rapidograph, if you have, any of you know what that is. So it's, it's a type of mechanical pen and looks like he used here a uh, pencil for the grayscale. This is Amy Wong and um, the caption is, I like this painting because it has a bench. So I just thought this was a nice slice of life, which is what single panel cartoons tend to be. Dog at a psychiatrist's couch and he's saying, they moved my bowl. I don't know how many of you can relate to this if you have dogs. <laughs> This is by a man named Charles Barsotti, who is very well known in, um, in, in, in the New Yorker's uh, pages. Look at the simple lines, a very simple line, nothing complicated. A lot of it is, is about the idea and how the words work really well with, 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 with what the drawing is. Um, this is one of mine, one of the more, more popular ones that I did for the New Yorker. And the woman saying to her, her date, I'd invite you in, but my life's a mess. Sometimes with cartoons like this, you just take a cliche and change it. And that's what the humor is. So um, now sequential is another kind of single panel. It's a version of a single panel cartoon where you, you and I've done a number for the New Yorker. Here's one by George Booth. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a comic strip, only there's no boxes. And here's the dog, the dog is barking at the dandelion and the dandelion flowers just go away the uh, uh, seeds just go away and the dog is smiling, I think. It's not a laugh out loud funny idea, but I love it. It's just sort of, sort of sweet and it's a piece of life. And we all sort of know dogs like this, right? Now, this is one of mine, speaking of dogs, another, another dog cartoon by me. It was my first cartoon in the New Yorker. Man's walking down the street and he thinks to himself, hmm, maybe I don't pet dogs enough. And so he turns around and he pets the dog and then he walks on. So it's, it's a it's a little piece of life in a cartoon and it would not work if it was one panel. Um, this is hard to read. I can't really read it, but it's, um, it's I read it earlier today. It's a, a funny cartoon by a more, um, more recent cartoonist, Liana Fink. If you, if you look her up on Instagram, she's extremely prolific on Instagram. Liana Fink, F-I-N-C-K. And she's really somebody to watch and to, to, to look at her work because I love her work. It's very simple. And it's funny and it's introspective. She thinks she, she's, she's a little like Roz and that she has a level of neurosis um, that comes out in her work. 
graphic novels. Now, I I have not written a graphic novel. I've done graphic narratives, like a short story, uh, but I have not done graphic novels. You guys probably are reading them all the time, right? It's wonderful that they're out there. This is one um, about Martin Luther King and the march on Selma in Selma back in the 60s. And so many of them are um, historical, like this one. It's a series, actually, book one. Um, Persepolis was one of the first graphic novels I read about a young woman in, in Iran, in Tehran. Um, powerful, powerful uh, graphic novel. I love it. And it was made into an animated film. Maybe you've seen it. If you haven't, try to, try to see it. And also try to read the book. There's two in this series. Um, Fun Home is by Alison Bechdel. It's about uh, a young woman. It's autobiographical. It's a memoir about um, her family growing up and how she came out as gay and her father was gay. And it was really, really great, great story. This one I have not read, but I love, I love the cover and I love, um, I love the drawings. Blankets by Craig Thompson. Um, and then children's books. Children's books, I've done those and they're like an extension. Many of them are like a drawn out cartoon. Cartoons are like little stories, no matter what form you're doing them in. Um, obviously graphic novels, obviously children's books, they're, they're stories. But so are single panels cartoons. <clears throat> um, and maybe you recognize some of these. And many of these actually in this picture were done by cartoonists, William Steig, um, uh, uh, James Stevenson. Animation, um, we all know the animation that we've seen on TV. The Flintstones is what I grew up on. There's the Simpsons and um, SpongeBob, Mickey Mouse. But there's other ways to do animation now, of course, than working for a huge studio like Disney or Pixar. 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 Pixar, sorry, um, I'm talking too fast. I don't normally talk this fast, <laughs> um, but um, where's the rest of the animation? Where did it go? Did I move it? Oh, it's down below. So I show you some of my animation later down when I show you my work. Um, so here's some of my single panel cartoons, and it's this. I work on pen with a crow quill pen. Here's some of my here's some of my tools: the crow quill pen and an ink. I'm sure Peter Cooper will talk to you about this because I think he works in pen and ink. Um, I think Michael Adder does too, but maybe Lalo Alvarez works on the computer. Some of us do both. And I also work on my iPad. So we all mix it up. We have wonderful tools now available to us. Uh, I do a lot of sandbox drawings, probably influenced by Charles Schultz. This little child is saying to another kid, I'm staying together for the sake of my parents. Another twist on a cliche. And this is a sequential one. Um, a woman gets on the subway in New York City knitting something. And by the time, if you go left to right, by the time she is ready to get off the subway, she has knit herself a sweater. So she's probably on the A train going <laughs> from 125th Street down into Queens or something. Um, I put this up here for you guys, for you, for you ju juniors and, and sophomores. For my junior year abroad, I'm going to learn how to party in a foreign country. Um, you take you take things in the culture, you take things in the news. I love to, to do cartoons based on news events as well. This was done during the Iraq war back way, you know, 20 years ago, whenever that was. Um, a woman saying to another woman, I didn't protest this war, but I'll try to protest the next one. They're very subtle, they're very kind of quiet humor, and it's a commentary on culture and society the kind of stuff I do, but there's a lot of laugh out loud, hysterical single panel cartoons. Mine just happened to be of this kind. Um, I wanted to show you some of my political cartoons. This was a, one I did for an organization called Cartooning for Peace in France. And, and so I couldn't use words because it's for international organization. And so I was just showing how a teacher is talking about peace, but the children are interpreting it their own way. Everybody can interpret peace in different ways. Um, did this during the, the, the beginning of the pandemic when we were all trying to love each other without touching each other. And this particular drawing got shared all over the world. I was very grateful for that. People seem, this seemed to resonate with people that, that a simple image sometimes can speak volumes that words cannot. And that's why I love doing what I do. 
I use the Statue of Liberty a lot to talk about issues that mean a lot to me, like freedom of the press. And these these cartoons, these last two, were not published anywhere except on my blog, um, and on Twitter, and Instagram. So I use social media a lot uh, to publish my work. Um, this is uh, another one about children being detained by our government um, in Texas. This is a couple of years ago. So I'm trying to use symbols and show what what was going on at the time through just visual uh, metaphors. Sometimes with, particularly with social media, you don't need to do a lot. If you just do something like this, it gets shared a lot and people like it and it shares, it spreads good thoughts and good ideas. And um, that's, I think political cartoons and, and single panel cartoons in particular are about sharing ideas with other people. This is a similar, similar sort of visual, but this is about uh, for um, um, LGBTQ uh, month. I did that. And then there's illustrations. I do illustrations for clients. This was for a, a magazine I worked for for 40 years. The illustration, we didn't talk about that, but um, it's this is another one I did recently for a client. Uh, it's a great way to make extra extra income when you're freelance by doing drawings for somebody else's article. So illustration is something that goes with somebody else's words. It does, doesn't, it can stand alone, but it, it doesn't have to. And my children's books, Dinosaur Halloween um, for Scholastic. I did seven of these uh, in the eighties and nineties for Scholastic. They were really fun to do. And I wanted them to be wordless because children's books can be just a story told in pictures. Um, you don't necessarily have to have words, but Scholastic asked me to put a few words in, so I did. Um, and then recently, this one for um, Holiday House. And this one is all for Holiday House. Um, and then some animations I did. Uh, this was for Martin Luther King's birthday. I do these on my iPad. So you can make really interesting and subtle animations and, and uh, they don't have to be fancy. As you, as you see, I'm not skilled at this. I'm not trained at this. I taught myself just by fooling around on my iPad. And then during the pandemic, I did some GIFs. I learned how to make GIFs using different programs um, on my phone. It's all about experimentation. The TV is saying breaking news and this woman's hair is, this is, this is done a couple of years ago when it just seemed like not, you know, there was always breaking news. Um, and this one is a simple animation of a woman running and being happy. I think that's, oh no, there's a few more. Oh, that's it, okay. So that's, that's an overview of what I know about different cartoon fields and how you, how you can cross over back and forth into the different fields. I mean, um, I'm still writing children's books. I'm, I'm still fooling around with animation. I'm still doing my single panel cartoon. So you don't have to choose. <laughs> you can if you want to, but there's a lot of variety. Let me stop sharing this. Or should I share it and show that I have to share it again? Because we have some, we have a poll. I want to share, share it to, to ask you a few questions. Where is it? Okay, there we go. All right. So these are just some considerations I had. Um, so if you have a style, sometimes your style will fit with a different kind of sensibility or a different kind of format. Like mine is, is a very light style, so it works really well with single panel cartoons. Um, I tried to use my light style and my quiet nature that I'd have in my cartoons in, politi in the political cartoon realm, which is not the norm. In political cartoons, they tend to be very opinionated, very, um, I call them loud. And, and some of them are fantastic and very important political cartoons. And they can be very loud in their opinions. Mine are quieter. So I've been trying to push that form to using my political opinions in that form. Um, your, your work can go anywhere. You know, I mean, I, you can put it on social media anytime, of course. Uh, start a blog, start a website and put it on there, get feedback, Instagram is great. I'm on TikTok also. A little, I do a few things there, showing my hand drawing. There's so many opportunities now. You can't 
necessarily make money on these platforms. So that's part of the problem. They're, some of them, are, some of them are, are monetized and you can figure out ways to make money through them. But um, generally speaking, it's a way to get your work out there and get feedback from people, get, get well known if, if that's what you're wanting to do. And then obviously some of these formats need, you need collaboration with, with the publisher or a syndicate or an editor, like in a newspaper. Um, uh, so anyway, I thought I would uh, put out a poll, which form most is most interesting to you personally? Comics, single panel, sequential, graphic novel, editorial, or animation? I'm just really curious to see where young people now fall in their interests. And I just launched the poll in Zoom. So a lot of you are voting already, um, but you should see a little pop up on your screen where you can select um, which one you're most interested in. And as soon as you're all finished, we can take a look at the results together. That's fascinating. Are there any questions that came in, um, Katie, that Yes. And thank, my way. Yes, absolutely. And thank you to those of you who have been using the meet upvote feature that's helping me figure out which questions are most popular in the Q&A box. So we're going to start at the top there. Um, the first one is from Gabrielle. I'm noticing that they use symbols and visual language to make the message apparent so quickly. Do you think short and sweet is better than something complex? Oh, I think we need them both. Um... I personally, I go for the short and sweet, but that's my style and my way. That's just kind of the person I am. I don't talk a lot, which is weird because I just spent an hour talking or half an hour talking, but um, I like minimalism myself, but I think some forms you really need. Like I also, I mean, I love Gary Trudeau who did that strip Doonesbury I showed you earlier and his, his cartoons, his comic strip about politics and cultural issues are very detailed in particularly with words. So um, it, that's kind of not a non-answer. <laughs> um, it just depends on what you want. I think they're both important. Thank you. And I can end the poll now. We got 95% of folks participating. Wow. So I'm sharing the results. Can you all see it? Okay, animation looks like it's the top. The most, most people are interested in animation. Yeah, we got 40% animation, 31% graphic novels, 10% single panel, 9% comic strips, 6% children's books, 3% editorial cartoons, and 2% sequential. That's fascinating. There's, there's so many places that you can go. I'm sure your teachers can, can uh, guide you. There's many places to study animation, many, many places, and, uh, and, and everything else, too. I mean, there's a, there's a cartoon college in Vermont that I know about. There's, I mean, when I was starting out, maybe one or two schools, colleges taught cartooning. Many taught illustration. We didn't put illustration in here, but that's, that's another very viable profession um, that I should have talked more about that. But I, I know Peter Cooper will, will talk a lot about that. I mean, he's a cartoonist and an illustrator. And, and you understand the difference. It's a fine line between cartoonist and, and illustrator because many of us jump back and forth all the time. Um, but generally speaking, our cartoons can stand alone, whereas illustration has to be paired with or is usually paired with an article. Um, that's interesting. Another question out there, Katie, that, that you want to throw my way? And then we yeah. can go on to the next. We have a lot of questions. Um, so For while sure. you're moving on to the next one, I can read you the next most popular. Would you say that making a living as an artist is difficult? How would you recommend artists get exposure in such a saturated market? That's a great question, because it's so true. 
it's very much worth it for me. It has, it has been very much worth it for me. It's been hard at times. Um, and um, I've taken, you know, other types of jobs that were a more steady paycheck because with, with being freelance, you don't have, you usually don't have a steady paycheck. Being a comics creator, like for syndicates, if you manage to create an idea, a comic strip idea that, um, that a syndicate wants to buy or wants to, to promote, then you may be fine because it'll be a regular paycheck. Um, but generally, generally we, we all piece it together. But you're, you're your own boss. And, and that, there's something very nice about that. Um, animation is also a place where you could, I'm sure, get paid a regular, regular paycheck um, working for a studio. Um, what was the second half of the question? Um, um, the second half was, how would you recommend artists get exposure in such a saturated market? Um, I always say, but it may be harder even now because we've had social media around now for a good 10, 15 years, right? Uh, Twitter started in 2007. But I've always used Twitter and I put my work out there um, for free just to get my work out there. Um, also Instagram now and Facebook. Uh, so I share it liberally uh, and frequently to get people aware of my work. But I, it's not all I do, I mean, on, on the social media platform. So I try to, I try not to be a self-promoting machine. That's that's annoying. <laughs> so I mix it up with, with other positive things, talking to people I know on, on the social media platforms, just exchanging things about my life on social media. So it's a mixture of stuff. Um, but, and then trying to work for, um, trying to get, I don't know how it's done now. I'm sorry, I'm sorry I'm not up on how, I think, look, I think actually I do know a bit. I think Instagram can be, if you, if you make your Instagram page if you curate it nicely, it can be like a portfolio, which is what I used to do. I had a, you know, a, a book with my artwork in this big, you know, with plastic sleeves and all that, and I would schlep it around to publications and and leave it there for a week and then come back and pick it up. And they'd look at my work and they would think, okay, maybe we'll call her if we have a job. So that's how I did it then. Um, now I think people do use social media. You create a website, um, do a blog. Uh, uh, a newsletter or, you know, but put your, make sure you curate your material so that it really presents you in a good light um, on social media. Hope that answers your question. Um, so what I thought I'd do now, what time is it? 810, is do some drawing for you. I'm gonna share, stop sharing this and I'm gonna share um, my iPad. Now I draw, a lot on my iPad. Um, hello, where is it? Liza, while you're setting that up, we've gotten some questions about what program you use to draw on your iPad. Would you mind talking okay. a little bit about that? Sure. Um, there it is. Okay, that's the program. It's called Paper. And um, I love it. I've been using it probably for six years, it used to be called something different, but now it's owned by WeTransfer, it's called Paper. And it's, it's you know, it's not the most complicated site, like um, Adobe Illustrator, things like that. You can have, you can do a lot, a lot more things on those, um, on those platforms, on those uh, apps. But this one I find is very simple because I'll just show you, see, there's a, there's a pen, a pen function down here and I'm gonna put it on black and I can change the color infinite to, to infinitely different oh that's not a good i'll show you in a minute so anyway the pen has different sizes and it looks it looks like a croquel pen if any of you have played around with a croquel pen you can make by by pressuring the, the stylus in a different way it'll make different um lines and you can just of course get rid of it but um, you know, you could, there's there's 
endless color choices here. And you can, you know, say I made that green and I wanted to add blue to it. I tip on this, I green there, and I make the color down here. So there's a lot of fun different ways to make colors. Uh, there's a brush tool. Anyway, I was going to draw for you so you'll see, but it's called paper. Um, and this is basically all it does. There's a few fancy bells and whistles that uh, I play around with sometimes, but there's no there's no layers or anything like that. What I like about this is that it's um, very intuitive. So what I thought I would do is, what do we have? Eight, 12, okay. What I thought I'd do is do a drawing. It's an idea I came up with the other day. Um, and I'm gonna do it in a, one of, the, one of the drawbacks of this app is it tends to switch switch things on you without you knowing it. Um, see, just switch to eraser. <laughs> Uh, and you'll see this it pop up. So I'm going to do this, this drawing for you, a single panel cartoon, a very simple one. Um, And then I'm going to do it in, in another form and see which you like better. Actually, uh, and I did draw another form, same idea in a, in a slightly different form. And you can see how one idea can be made into different, into a slightly different feel just by uh, how I decide to do it. So this is a single panel. So there's a ball here and a stick. You're outside. A hill. And um, actually, see, this is another tool in this app that I like. I'm going to move them up a little bit because I don't have room for the caption. Okay. You can't type on here, so I have to, to write the caption. So. <clears throat> Raj, is there something in front of um, the caption that you're writing on your screen? It looks like a like record button. Oh, yeah. This, that's funny. There. Oh, there we go. Oh, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. that's the idea for the single panel cartoon. Um, a little wash in there, you can see. I can have some spots. Um, so the dog saying, we could just talk. <laughs> the sequential version of that would be, oops. And I used to love, when I first worked for the New Yorker, I did a lot of sequential cartoons. I just really loved the way they looked. Um, they don't run them that often anymore, but they do have, if you look at the New Yorker, if any of you are interested, they're using a lot more cartoons in, in other forms in the magazine, not just the single panel, but they're doing um, multi-panel cartoons, sort of like the sequential mixtures with words, um, it's called Shouts and Murmurs is the name of the section for this new illustrated humor section. Um, so this is a little more difficult to draw because it's takes a little more thought on my part. You have to be really careful when you're drawing um, cartoons because, as you know, the expression is key. Now, this dog, I don't know if I like his expression. 
he looks a little alarmed. I don't want him to look alarmed. <laughs> I want him to look just sort of blase. I'm not sure, now he looks worried. So it's really, um, it's a little bit better. He's just sitting there and there's the stick. And I, I'm sure you know what's gonna happen here. Um, I mean, I'll, what I could do is in the interest of time, I can actually duplicate. This is another tool with this app, which I love. So I can duplicate that, right? I wouldn't normally do this if I were drawing. Um, drawing it uh, for submission. That's the stick. And then, then I can't duplicate it this time. So I'm gonna try my best to make the woman look the same. It's not bad. <laughs> so, <clears throat> the balls, the balls out there in the distance. Um, I'm going to actually duplicate the dog. Oops, no. Because I also have to make sure she's looking at the dog because her eye was too high up. And then I'm going to open his mouth and have him speak. Now I could put the caption underneath them. Sticker that are out there in the distance. <laughs> or um, we the funny the humor in this is the fact that a dog would would rather talk than fetch the ball. So this is a sequential version of the idea. Um, you could also do a speech balloon, but I think it would I think a speech balloon might interfere with the with the drawing. So anyway, oh, and then there's one more that I did beforehand to show you. Then I thought, well, could we make this is this is the app. I'll show you. It's, it's got these great journals. Um, then I did a political card, political version of it. Instead of the person, I, I made it a dog and cat fighting on the left. And then this is I would never submit this to anybody because it's not quite there yet. But it's to show you how I took an idea that was a simple dog and, and person ball throwing cartoon and putting it into a political idea. And you can see the, um, um, the, the Russian flag, the dog is wearing a Russian flag and the cat is wearing a Ukrainian flag. So um, instead of fighting, they could just talk. So that's, that's, what, that's what that is. So I wanted to ask you, which one of these versions do you like better? So we'll do another poll. And we just launched the poll. Um, I see a lot of folks filling it out right now. Liza, while they're filling it out, do you want to take another question? Yes. Awesome. So the next question is from someone who is just about to start college, has a passion for art, um, and is going to college for a degree in cybersecurity because of its financial stability. So what is your opinion on going to school for stability versus spending time to build a presence or career in art? Oh, great idea. Great question. Um, you, you really probably should, I mean, it's, it's good to have a job um, when you launch your art career. So have something that you that pays the bills and you do your artwork in your spare time. And um, I, that's what I did. I went to college, I did get an art degree, but I, my, one of my other specialties was in um, museum work and biological drawings. So um, believe it or not. <laughs> so I got a job at the museum in the art department. So I had a job that paid me a daily paycheck, weekly paycheck. So, you know, it is hard. Um, 
there are some colleges, art colleges, that will will help you find a job in the art field. Um, art art special. I did not go to an art school, but art schools might have more ways for you to be hired right out of art school. But I don't know the details on those. So um, there's nothing wrong with going for a regular paying job, going for for a discipline that will pay the bills and that you you don't hate. I mean, uh, and then you do your artwork on the on the side. Because if you really want to become an artist, then you'll you'll find a way to do it. You'll make the time. Thanks, Liza. I know that was a really popular one. Um, our poll also, we have 90% participated now. So I'm ready to share those results if you are. That's great. So interesting. So you guys preferred top would be the sequential one. I like that. I'm looking at it right now. <laughs> That's great. Um, so I think I did, I'll tell you this much. I put the, um, the single panel one or a version of it on Instagram the other day. Uh, I did it, had done it um, on paper with pen and ink and um, it got so many likes. I'm not saying, I didn't do a sequential version so they might've liked that even more. But the idea of the dog just wanting to talk, I think, is what resonates with so many people. They find it um, funny, I guess, or charming or something. I don't know. <laughs> but um, that's what this is about. It's about making people happy, making people think, making people enjoy looking at something. So another question? Yes, uh, we have a ton for you. So we'll get through what we can. The next question. How do you deal with burnout? Burnout, oh gosh. Um, I take a break. There's the burnout uh, on a given, any given morning or day because I try to come up with my ideas in the morning and sometimes it just doesn't work or I, I get into a negative headspace, you know, I'm telling myself, oh, they didn't, they didn't buy last week, so why are they gonna buy for me this week? Because the New Yorker is a system and actually, I want to tell you guys, if you want to do single panel cartoons, it's fairly open at the New Yorker now, more so than when I started. So there's ways, Google, go online and Google how to submit to the New Yorker. And there's, there's a systematic way to do that, to send in your single panel cartoons to the editor. And they look at that, that internet, um, those internet submissions on a monthly basis, I think. So it's a very easy way to do it. Anyway, um, you're gonna have you're gonna have times when you think either you're not funny or the editors hate you, or, um, and and you just have to be kind to yourself and and realize that that's part of the process. You're gonna have those thoughts and just put them away, put them across on the other side of the room, and and either keep trying to draw something else or go go for a walk or you know go throw the ball for the dog or make yourself something to eat. Just do something else or take the rest of the day off if you if you can um because i get rejection every single week the new yorker I, that's what i was gonna say is the new yorker you we all submit the same way those of us who have been working there for for um who have, for those of us who've been in the magazine you send in your cartoons on a tuesday i set mine in this, in this morning like six to eight cartoons sketches i do them on my ipad and they, by Friday, they tell us whether they want to buy one or not. So nobody's telling me what to draw and nobody's telling me that, you know, that I'm going to sell something. I can't be sure that I'll sell something that week. So you have to trust your own instinct as to what you think is funny and um, just keep drawing. Drawing a lot is, is important, even at my stage. Just keep drawing, keep those juices flowing. Thank you, Liza. And if, I know we only have four minutes left. Do you want to do one more question before we wrap up? Sure. So we got a lot of questions about your personal style. Um, I think the biggest questions are, how did you develop that style? And how often do you stray from your typical style? Hmm. Um, I, I started drawing, as I mentioned in the beginning, I had very specific tastes and who I like to look at. And 
and cartoons, and I would mimic their style when I was a kid. Um, very minimal lines. Um, Sampe is another one. James Thurber. <clears throat> um, people that you can look up online, you probably don't know their work because they're not around anymore. Um, and I just kept drawing like that. I just really liked, and I would look at other people's work and and it would give me ideas, not, I don't mean I'd steal their ideas, but I would see how they would draw a living room scene. And I think, oh, maybe that's a good way to approach it. I'll try to do that in my drawing style. And, and that's, I just have had that style since I was a child. And I have strayed from it in terms of not using this, I've, I've used more wash, more grayscale, more, more, um, yeah, more, more grays in my cartoons over the years, but I'm, I'm moving away from that again. I'm not sure why I went there in the first place, but I mean, they're, they're nice cartoons. I don't dislike them, but you learn to play around with um, style within the format. I'm sure um, both Peter and Lala will talk about that as well. Um, it's just a matter of drawing, drawing all the time, just draw a lot. <laughs> And draw what you think is what you think works. Thank you so, so much, Liza. Oh, sorry. Oh, Go ahead. <laughs> no, I hope I hope that answered the questions, and um, I really am appreciative that you asked me to do this, Katie. This Glassic asked me. It was a real pleasure. Thank you so, so much for joining us. This has been an absolute pleasure for me. I know that I've seen a lot of notes come through in the chat saying the same. So thank you so much, Liza. And thanks to all of you who joined us tonight. Um, it is so wonderful having you here, having your energy. And thank you for all of your insightful questions. I'm sorry that we did not get to all of them, but we hope that you will all join us again next week. Again, we're meeting at the same time on Zoom. Use the same link. Thank you guys so much. You guys keep drawing. Don't stop. Thank you all. Good night, everybody. Good night, Liza. Thank Bye. you.